For more than 100 years, these stacks, along with their plumes of toxic waste, dominated Bullaroo's skyline. At the time, the Pasminka Cockle Creek Smelter was billed as the Hunter region's first heavy industrial site. It sprawled across 191 hectares. Lead and zinc smelting was carried out there between March 1897 and September 2003. Three years after the site closed in May 2006, its iconic 87 metre high chimney stack was demolished and remediation work began in earnest. The industry was very important to the industrial development of the region and provided essential materials for the Australian domestic market and export dollars. Unfortunately, the former smelter left undeniable impacts on people's health and it left a legacy of contamination. To make matters worse, many of the homes in Bullaroo are quite old. Some of them even date back to the early days of the smelter. And whilst there's a legacy of contamination from the smelter, those homes, by virtue of their age, also have other lead issues, particularly for example, from lead paint. The lead abatement strategy, or LIS as it's commonly known, was designed by Ferrier Hodgson, the deed administrator for the site, and it was designed in conjunction with the state government through the EPA and with uh, advice from the health authorities. It was signed off by the Department of Planning and was a consent condition uh, on the remediation of the overall site. So from 2007 to 2013 the LAS operated in the residential areas that were affected. They were defined by a grid system of affectation and uh, were really designed as a cap and cover so uh, acknowledging that not all the material could be removed or that it was practical to remove it because in many cases you would, to do that you would need to demolish homes and that's not what people wanted. So the LAS is uh, a system, a cap and cover, that has been used in other areas around the world. The lead abatement strategy wasn't uh, supported entirely by the community. There was some scepticism about it and uh, certainly that's, that's understandable. So the question is whether or not it was uh, well developed, whether it was well applied and whether it's going to work into the future. So as part of this, uh, to try and address these concerns, the government established uh, two bodies. One is the Lead Expert Working Group, which uh, has on it experts, experts in soil contamination, uh, the impacts, uh, health impacts of any contamination, but also um, uh, people from the who have a regulatory function, whether it's from state government, the EPA. But very importantly, there's a community-led reference group which has been established. It has members of the local community who are supported by experts, but people who have a good network back into the local community, so to the school or just into the residential areas, clubs, and uh, I think that that's very important. Residents are understandably worried about the ongoing impact that lead contamination can have on their properties. They're worried about the safety for their, their children, for their families and visitors to the site, but also whether or not they can redevelop their property, what the impact will be, the cost, and also whether or not there's an impact on the value of their properties. As for concerns about human health, I think the answer can be found by looking at the recent blood lead level testing done by Hunter New England Health, which showed that all 70 people who participated had blood lead levels less than the New Australian National Health and Medical Research Council's standard that would trigger further review. That new standard is five micrograms per decilitre, a halving of the previous level of 10. So for everybody to achieve that was an excellent result. However, the effectiveness of the LAS was called into question following a 2014 research study by Macquarie University students that found evidence of elevated lead levels remaining in local yards and public grounds. In many ways this was not surprising as the students did dig under the cap. Regardless of whether or not we agree with the conclusions of the study or what it was pointing to, 
Uh, we certainly uh, should take it as an opportunity to go back and have a look at whether or not the LAS has worked. This is a, a really good opportunity, um, and particularly for those people in the community that weren't around at the time or didn't really understand what was happening with the LAS. This allows us to actually further inform, but more importantly, to make sure that the cap and cover method of the LAS has worked and that this material does not become bioavailable, particularly for our children. However, it certainly uh, is my concern that uh, we, we do not allow anybody to become complacent and think that we have completed the project because the LAS is in place. Following the results of the Macquarie University study and uh, after discussions with Professor Mark Taylor, who is an acknowledged expert in these areas, I uh, took a trip to Idaho to visit what was one of the largest, if not the largest, lead and zinc smelter in the United States at the time and closed in the early 1980s. So I wanted to have a look at what they've done because they are roughly 20 years ahead of Australia in what they're doing and they seem to have done a very good job of addressing the concerns, particularly the health concerns, of that community. Bunker Hill is in the Cord Lane Valley in northern Idaho. It's been impacted by smelting and by mining operations for a long time. It's a very good example of the impacts of these toxic industries. In July this year I took my own study tour to Idaho where I met with people from the Idaho equivalent of the EPA. Perhaps even more importantly I, I met with local officials from that area around the former Bunker Hill smelter who have been very much involved in implementing the remediation. In Idaho they certainly haven't dismissed the health issue. This was one of the greatest public health issues ever in the United States and they are very mindful of it. The area was designated a US EPA Superfund site these areas are the worst of the worst, with very high blood lead levels, in this case, in children. They have largely turned that around. Blood lead levels are now good, very closely monitored. But the other impact that they had, of course, was the stigma of coming from a dirty, toxic, poisonous town that largely destroyed the local economy. In Bunker Hill, they have used a cap and cover system, not dissimilar to what has been used here to address the issue at Pesminka. In Bunker Hill they realised that the cap and cover system is no good if you cannot ensure its integrity and perpetuity and they've achieved that without an undue and burdensome regulatory program. In many ways the simplicity of their program is why it's so effective. The program in the affected communities around Bunker Hill is managed by the Panhandle Health Service and anybody who wants to do anything on their residential, commercial property or even public property uh, need to have a permit. So those permits are provided very quickly because the process isn't to approve it as such, it's to ensure that there is a record of what has happened to that material. But more than that, the local authorities in Bunker Hill have a simplified process and help people in practical ways to deal with the issue. I think the simplification of a process is what our community needs here and I think that there's a lot that we can learn from what they've uh, developed in Bunker Hill over a number of years. It seems to me that we're probably going to need a sinking fund to deal with this in perpetuity. We already know that we have to deal with uh, what's known as the cell, which is, uh, has been specially constructed to deal with the material that came off the smelter site itself. But people will, in future, uh, be uh, re renovating homes, they'll be, uh, um, they'll be doing demolitions, they'll be putting in pools, or there'll be other works that bring about a need for some additional costs to deal with the contaminated material. For example, what happened at Marmong Point in the April storms were a reserve that had been built up with a lot of lead slag from the smelter site, probably done during the 1960s or 70s when this material was believed to be perfectly safe and good for this use, was exposed from the impact of wave erosion. But that's going to cost money to remove. Now do we just leave that for the state government or the council to pick up as these things occur in the future? Or do we have a legacy fund that does that? What about private residential properties that find the same material on their site? Do we have a legacy fund that assists them? I believe that we do. The reality is there's never going to be a day where we can draw a line and say the issue is resolved. This needs management in perpetuity and it can be done.